While immersed in the sensory overload that is New York City, the bounty of theaters, museums, all that New York City has to offer, a person is often provoked to reflect on the present state of our culture for better or worse. Well, Maxine Green, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy and Education at Columbia University's Teachers College, has been for years promoting exactly this kind of reflection. Maxine's students, as educators themselves, have a responsibility to nurture an appetite in their students for self-reflection through encounters with the arts and humanities. This inquiry creates meaning in their lives and for our collective well-being. They can go on to promote a more just and caring world. I was fortunate enough to have Maxine welcome me into her world where she lives a stone's throw from the Guggenheim Museum and overlooking Central Park. And so I had the following very enjoyable conversation with Maxine. Considering the fact that only rich people can buy art, it's a shame. There's going to be a show of Edward Hopper. And I could imagine just ordinary people finding something in those paintings. Who could own them? Nobody, and who could afford to go to the Whitney often enough to see them? It's really terrible and sad. Unless you're an art student or you know somebody. And, and as long as I'm able or you're able to expand my idea of creativity, you know, because I have to get myself out of the canonical, out of the traditional, out of Raphael, and out of uh, Popper, you know, and uh, like we've been able to encompass African art, some of it, you know, and Chinese art, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Islamic miniatures. So as, as long as I know, there are all those things that I don't know, how might you define the creative spark? It has to come from within. You know, it has to come from uh, the engagement of what's within with what's without. The spark comes in the, you know, what we call the transaction. Because once, it, once uh, if I were to say it comes from without, I immediately created dualism, you know, that there is a, an inner and an outer. Right. And I think of them like this, you know. And whatever the creative spark is, uh, it comes uh, usually unexpectedly. Maybe I see the tree, or maybe I'd like to write a poem, or, but there has to, to me anyway, there has to be that sort of a cross current, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything can compel. You know, I know, you know, the, the, it's kind of, I guess I call it desire, you know, not, not compulsion. And by desire, I mean a, a sense of space, of lack between what I am now and what I want to achieve or become. You know, so I, I think about it that way. Something urges, you know, and, uh, you want to feel an emptiness or something like that. But I don't think there's a compulsion unless it was in Michelangelo's studio, or, you know, or church we have. To and I always wonder when that happens. If you worked in those studios, there was a compulsion. I mean, damn it, you had to create. Did the creativity come from the originator or the people who were doing what he... Like I was looking at the tapestries in the museum and takes that fantastic work, you know. And you think, were those women, old women, were they, were they like people on an assembly line or were they, you know, it was yeah. difficult. <laughs> Far Angelico thought he was in touch and could reveal. Mm -hmm. So in those moments when he thought that, was that creative? Was he crazy? Was it religious? Was it hallucinatory? I don't think he could ever... Well, what do you think? 
I don't believe there's anything up there to be revealed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something that happened to him, partly probably out of uh, connection with other artists and the atmosphere. I guess it was in Florence or someplace in Italy, looking at all the pictures of the Holy Family, you know, looking at all the virgins and so, and then thinking uh, the different faces, like different parts of Italy, different women who pose for the virgin. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of interesting that the virgin became a kind of frame and an inspiration and the little peasant girl from God knows where suddenly, <laughs> you know, was transformed into a version of the Virgin, mm -hmm. you know. A vessel. Yeah. At this The red point state in time, and the blue state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do the red state artists need to hear from the blue state artists and vice versa? In their career or in their effort to become artists, they have much in common, probably. You know, where did it start? How did it start? How uh, resistant were your parents to what you wanted to do? You know, and, and you'd find out, for example, that in rural places in Florida, the, uh, the parents were shocked and, you know, something immoral was taking place. and. Uh, in Indiana, someplace else, they say they were the parents would be disappointed, but not shocked. I, mean, I think in that kind of conversation, uh, something in common would be established, but then all the different ways there are. Mm -hmm. of, and then I keep thinking of so many artists uh, were resisting, like all the uh, the great. Uh, writers in the 19th century were all rebelling against their bourgeois relatives, you know, mm -hmm. or, but then at the same time sort of torn apart by guilt. <laughs> and, you know, and it just so, like there's one story by Thomas Mann uh, called Tony O'Kruger, who says, I wasn't brought up in a little green wagon, you know, and he's an artist but he has a bliss for the commonplace. You know, something is always pulling him back. Uh -huh. And I think it's so interesting to me if they become artists in their refusal to be bourgeois businessmen. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't mention further what a prolific author Maxine has been over the years. Noteworthy is her recent Variations on a Blue Guitar, which is comprised of a selection of her talks from the summer lecture series given jointly by Columbia University Teachers College and the Lincoln Center Institute for the Arts and Education, a place where she's additionally been serving as the philosopher in residence for over 30 years now. Considering the fact that only rich people can buy art, it's a shame. Mm -hmm. Like these. Uh, there's going to be a show of Edward Hopper mm -hmm. at the Whitney. They're wonderful, and I can imagine just ordinary people finding something in those paintings. Who could own them? Nobody, and who could afford to go to the Whitney often enough to see them? It's really terrible and sad. Unless you're an art student or you know somebody, you still have, like at the, at the MoMA, isn't it $20? It's, yeah. That's shocking. Mm -hmm. Like you can't go to theater unless you have a hundred bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Back on the, the word immoral. You know, I think of, the, of uh, what's his name, Maplethorpe, mm -hmm. and that, uh, it just, it's, uh, you keep wondering, what is it about people that they insert meanings into the maple thought that aren't, were, he never thought of? But they project into it all their prurient ideas, you know. I don't think you should stamp out, like I uh, think of in Walden. One of the things I like about is a chapter where he says uh, he, he goes through the woods like a wild animal 
And if you saw a woodchuck, he'd like to tear it apart, you know, and eat it the way. And it's, it's, it's a wildness in himself, you know. But if he killed that, he'd just be a simpering, pious pencil maker, you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But I think that it's, it's hard to say we should nurture the violence in ourselves. But I don't think you should kill it. You, know, you take a drive like that and put it in a, in a more fulfilling or positive direction. I was going to say Jasper Jones, but it's no, not Pollock. that Jackson Paul. Pollock, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, what was sealed up in him and the way he died, you know, the sort of terrible extremes he went to. And, uh, I, and people think that those paintings were sort of chance, and I don't think so. I mean, I think he knew exactly what he was doing. And he knew he was transforming art by doing that. Uh, were you ever out in the Hamptons in his house? No. You, know, you can still see, uh, I think in the barn, uh, he did some of this, and it's, it remains on the floor of the barn. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was a terrible drunk. And I know I had a student, we were talking about adoption, and this girl said, I was adopted. And then she said, uh, when, uh, uh, when he was killed, Jackson Pollock, he was speeding and he had two women in the car and he was drunk. And she said, one of those women was my mother, only she put me out for adoption. And then she started, well, do I have art in me? You know, do I inherit something? Uh -huh. So she left her adoptive parents, I guess. Uh, because they were that kind that thought art was immoral. And she's wondering, is she carrying a piece of, of uh, you know, a Jackson Pollock inside? And she didn't know. She didn't know if he made her mother pregnant or what, and they uh -huh. never found out. So it's a peculiar mystery story. Yeah. Is there something self-destructive uh, yeah. about me? If you look through the eyes of somebody old like me, uh, you know, I'm st you have, I have to struggle with my own treasure trove, you know, my classics and the things I love and Flaubert and, uh, you know, and I'm writing an article now, writing, I hope, a book. And, uh, and it's sort of about philosophy and literature. And, and I'm trying to say that uh, science and philosophy can't answer the questions we have today with the world the way it is. And I was talking about how the foundations have slipped and the structures are, are broken, are caving in. And how do people live through that? And uh, what, what literature does, what art does, is at least involve them with themselves, you know. You have to make some choice against the bureaucracy, against the administration, you, you know. So, but, so I keep thinking, what literature should I use? And uh, I'd like to use everything for the tragedies, you know, on up. Because the literature says it much more clearly than and literature doesn't answer any questions, which is the good part. <laughs> it leaves everything hanging. <laughs>